as ever, we have Anne Lord Jackson with us um, talking about all things sensory. Hello, Anne. Hello, good to see you. And you have a different background today. <laughs> yes, all, all my all my things have gone gone into storage. Hopefully, plan permission. You know, God willing, we will have a, a brand new clinic, a great workspace, a great um, Zoom space. Uh, really be able to to meet sensory needs in a, in a much better way. But they're all in storage happening. for now. Yeah, mm. well, it, it, change is good. It's happening, but. Mm. It's fine. We'll adjust. It's okay. Right. Let me jump in uh, with a comment that came in from Mary from Montana in the USA. Uh, Anne is such a joy. One cannot help smiling just listening to her. And yes, her laughter is the cherry on the top. Good informative interview. Looking forward to next week. Bless you, Mary. That's all I can say. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Right, let me jump into a question. Uh, why is it that music can help us to remember certain events from the past and bring a smile to our face as it does? What is going on for that to happen? I do like it, but I'm just wondering why music can be such a powerful memory reminder. Yeah, I just love the way that our brain is so connected um, and it had to be designed as it was right from the very beginning so like we're, we're made human we're designed as, as fully human and we have such the neuronal networks that fly around the place are phenomenal and the interconnections and the way that the neural pathways go are utterly utterly amazing and I don't even know the half of it um and I think uh, it, it's a beautiful thing there's always more to find out about um our, our design how we're made how, how things actually are um but yeah we have all our sensory systems go into that limbic system um we, we we've spoken a bit, bit before the way that smell goes straight in to where you've got the amygdala the hippocampus a lot of those main memory uh, areas within the limbic system in the very center of the brain but the lovely thing about music is um that there are so many emotions that we attach to music and if music didn't move us in any way then we probably wouldn't connect too much to it um but if we have associated a pleasurable experience or a negative experience um or uh yeah just just the memories that go along with it there will be memories that will link in and that will link back to that limbic system and bring things straight out again um but when it has a deep emotional connection then it is so much more powerful uh because you remember the 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 emotions uh that go along with with that memory as well i do remember that when joe was uh training to do a particular job she had to read a lot of pretty unpleasant stories about various people as part of her training. And at mm. the time she was listening to was Dido, I think, an artist. And she listened to lots of Dido back in the, this is what, early noughties or something. And <laughs> it was years later that we put Dido on and she turned it off and she said, I can't listen to that. Because right. it's remem I'm remembering all the stories um, that I was reading about as part of my training for a job. Yeah. Th and that was in the background. So it's taken a, you know, nearly, she quite likes it again now, but it's taken nearly 20 years to undo that well not undo the memory but to sort of to not have that such a strong negative reaction yeah absolutely and, that, and that's a lot of the work that i do with those who are um adopted or who've had trauma in their lives and because so much of trauma is connected to sensory experiences what they've smelt when the trauma's happened or what they've heard in the background or the anticipation if a door creaks or a floorboard creaks or um or if they've been touched in a certain way that wasn't very pleasant those that unpleasantness absolutely is tied to those memories so even if as uh just uh, naively as, as we might do or with not even thinking we play certain things there are certain sounds there are certain smells and then we have these massive responses in children in particular, because it's more the the, the uh, traumatized children that I work with. Um, and we see these massive responses and we just think, what was that that just triggered a really big meltdown, a really big explosion of, of behaviors that's really not, not nice for them, not nice for anybody else. So we have to, and that's when we backtrack and we think, we know that the sensory processing, because it is so foundational, has so many memories attached to it and emotional memories, which makes them even more powerful. 
that we have to then look when we see a behavior it's like okay let's go back let's go back to those triggers um where we can because when even even before a child has language their body is processing all of that sensory information because it is their pre-birth and just after birth and continues through adulthood so before they have language they might not be able to put words together about what happened to them when they were little but it will still be having an impact because it had a sensory impact on their being and that's what the brain has remembered and held on to so the lovely thing about therapy like your wife went through is that it can take time but it is possible we have the neuroplasticity the brain is able to change and if we do it beautifully sensitively really carefully often as planned out as we possibly can do to try and make sure that we're protecting their systems as much as possible in that transition from replacing negative emotion negative memory slowly 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 over to positive and then they are freer much freer to to to, to go and then those triggers those sights those sounds those smells are not quite as um awful and and triggering as as they were before but it is it's a, yeah it's a slow process yeah Often. i mean for joe it's like 20 years sort of mm. previous that she was not you know the, the music was just in the background as she was studying just to, you know, she had some background noise and uh yeah it, it, it just triggered it when we played dido much much later yeah. and now she's fine but how how would you work in terms of sensory well, what is it you do for someone who's got a piece of music or a creaky door or or there's some audible initiated memory how do you undo that okay so there's uh, two main ways. The first, which is the bit that I love most because I'm a sensory integration trained therapist, is that we do lots of um, good proprioceptive vestibular, get the system working really well, get it as calm and regulated as possible so that those um, potential triggers are not so triggering in the first place. So that's where I would go to because it's not quite so um it's, it's just nicer. It's just the way that I work. The other side, which is the an, another effective way of doing it, is that if there was a piece of music, um, we would have it on a really, really potentially low level to begin with, but do something that they really, really enjoy doing so that we can pair and start to desensitize those associations, use those positive memories, those positive emotions, get them in a good place first. So whether it be if they're doing some, uh, they really enjoy some baking or they're trampolining or they're doing an art project or something, then I would put that sound, if we were able to identify a trigger, put that sound, that smell, whatever, on a really low basis. Um, So that although it's there, and the cognitive brain pays attention to it, we've still got a much higher proportion of good stuff in the system. We've got good feelings, we've got good neurochemicals. It's just that they're in a much better place. So it it might impact them, but it shouldn't do it so much. And then the next time we can get them in a good place, doing something that they're really happy with and increase. So maybe the first time it was either really on a low level or it was just literally on for one, one second just to see just quite what a startle reaction or quite how it affected people's mood or their thinking processes or what what it quite triggered so if it was if you started off doing it just a few seconds at a time you'd increase the amount of time or you'd have it at a lower level and then over time would increase increase the volume and and then just be really careful very vigilant and then stop it and um, when not and also giving that person control if it's music that they have the control to switch it off whenever they think that they're done. So when people have the control, then they are much more able. They they will push themselves to tolerate things much better than we can judge from the outside. Um, and if we give them the control, some of some people will just really want to press through it and, and be determined that it is not going to take them back to where they were. So yeah give them give them the control and they will they will tolerate things a lot longer than sometimes i i might choose because i'd be more sensitive because i wouldn't want to be setting anybody off or disturbing anybody or dysregulating anybody uh that reminds me of something i read a long time ago 25 plus years ago and it was about um how to get the most out of office staff is to put a thermostat that they actually can control in an office 
Because if you say, right, this is the temperature you're going to have, then some will be hot, some will be cold. But if you give them some control as a, as a, as a group of people, then actually they're, they're happier, they're more content, then they're more peaceful. Therefore, they're actually able to achieve more without doing more because now they're not so distracted that they can't control the temperature. Is it the same That's, sort of thing? Absolutely. Um, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> well done, that person <laughs> that thought of doing that. <laughs> anyway, even though you've got different people that will... Um, uh, we'll, we'll go and maybe ch- you know change the thermostat accordingly. The fact they've got a bit of control, they're then able, much more able to cope with it when it's not their place because they know actually were they bothered enough, they could go and change it. Um, but most of us have a higher tolerance of things when we know that we can control something. It's when we feel completely powerless that it's it's that's when we can get a bit stressy. And that's where all of these feedback, give us your comments, what do you think, these surveys, hearing what people have to say, they're so good because they just release the kind of stress and the arousal levels in, in systems that just get built up because there is no outlet. It's kind of those, those little kettles that you have to take the lid off you know it's got to boil over you have to give it let off steam literally <laughs> yeah. i just realized that's where it comes from isn't it really <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Um, yeah yeah right. and uh, one uh, of my favorite phrases actually i do have to say one of my favorite phrases especially working with parents is you know we are in charge but they are in control so, you know, if, if nothing else that, you know, that's definitely it's not quite going to be on my epitaph, but it, it's one of those things that are just like, you know, a sign that we're, we're, we're in charge, whether you're a boss, actually, or whether you're a parent or whether you're in school or whether you're whatever, you are the one in charge. You have the responsibility. You have the authority. But each of the individuals within that, they need really to be in control. Um, it, it's not meaning controlling but in control of the things that affect their own sensory systems because they know themselves, really. That makes sense. I I used to work in an office where uh, two of the women were really, really cold, so they wrapped up. All the heating was just ridiculously hot. All the blokes were walking around literally sweating, dehydrating, actually, and they were there. And and it's like, could you not put a jumper on? Oh, no, we prefer a shirt. Yeah, but, but if you put a jumper on, then we won't, the rest of us, be literally dehydrating from sweating because it's so hot in it yeah so it's that working together but yeah it's a desensitizing thing yeah yeah but like in commun- communication i think we're, we're, we're both big <laughs> communicators the importance but that's it you, you've got something there to open with a conversation if you give people the freedom for choice it's like you know that your choice is going to impact someone else's it's like when people have take take up their rights their rights are always going to affect somebody else's rights so it's like well how do then we you know how do we then work together within that but if you at least start off giving people the choice then conversations can be had whereas if it's like no choice this is how it is that there is no conversation that that they can't be conversation because there isn't that openness to 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 pass on control to anybody else it's being Mm -hmm. held by someone Cool. Who knew we were going to go there? Right. Um, okay. This is, I, I got, I knew this from your Facebook page because you put a question at one of our listeners asked, asked you a question. Okay. I thought, okay, well, let's go here. So I think your question was, uh, if there was a sensory topic you'd love to know more about that would help you, what would that be? That was the question that you asked. And then one of our listeners said, if you'd asked me, I would say I had sensory issues. Sorry. If you'd asked me if I had sensory issues, I would probably have said no. But having listened to your interviews on here, Pure 24-7 Radio, I'm starting to realise I am prone to some sensory overload in some certain situations. So in answer to your question, I guess it's just general awareness, helping people to understand the basics of how their senses work and to recognise the signs when senses are being overstimulated. Oh, do you know, I still have to go back and collate all of those things. That's really good. I'm going to have to go back and think, oh, yeah because I'm, I'm working on lots of things you know we're revamping we're merging this year there's you know rebranding that the whole website is, is is changing so over the next few weeks there's going to be lots of hopefully good things and then into the into the next years um to go so what i've picked up if i've picked up correctly it would be more like the signs of overload would that be would you be uh yeah I didn't think I had them and then I'm realizing having listened to you that actually sometimes I probably do have olo- overload in certain situations Mm -hmm. what overload does more than anything is set off the sympathetic um aspect of our autonomic nervous system so yeah the sympathetic nervous system will increase um things like 
heart rate might increase. Um, so you'll start to feel a little, potentially a little bit more anxious uh, when the heart rate increases. Uh, you may start sweating, although that would definitely be more more on the extreme, but you might notice a difference uh, in that or you or your body temperature you know might might rise a bit and you'll notice you're a little bit warmer than you were um even if you're not actually starting to sweat. You might notice well you probably wouldn't, but other people might notice your pupils might um dilate more. Um, um what are the other signs and symptoms definitely um feeling more on edge um that whole sense of peace and calm from relaxation depending where your baseline is um definitely it it plays a big part in anxiety massive part in anxiety um so you might start to forget things um because of the impact of the of the stress in the system so forgetfulness heart rate starting to sweat a little bit certainly feeling a little bit more increase in temperature uh yeah you might feel in more fidgety and more on edge i think those are likely to be you know likely to be the things that you know being a bit quicker a bit sharper, a bit more snappy as well in responses back to things. That all goes along with anxiety. That goes along with just being a little bit more high, more highly aroused. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he if he comes back and 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 says, yeah, those are the things that that, that I I would see. And also to hear if anybody else has anything extra, if they particularly react in a certain way. I'd say they yeah. they're the typical ones, but it'd be really fascinating to see because it always is. Um, if anyone else recognizes what are those subtle differences ha that happen in you that make you realize that actually, yes, I'm, I am, I am moving into sensory overload. Um, mm. So I uh, want to things that uh, Joe had the other day, they had some training and there were far too many people in a room. So she started to get quite hot because literally it was hot because there were, you know, more bodies than the room could cope with. And as that temperature rose and the people were in there, um, she was struggling more and more. Now, she kind of got through that as she would. If that was me, I'd have been clamoring for the door because the heat would rise. I would not cope. And with too many people in the building, I can't get out the door. Yeah. Although I'm in no way claustrophobic, all of a sudden I become claustrophobic because like, I don't want to be unable to leave the room because it's too hot. And that that heat then starts to really get at me. Then I know that I would get aggravated. I would get quite agitated uh, and I would I'd have to leave the room just for no other reason than there's too many people um in too confined a space but all of a sudden i become sort of partially i suppose claustrophobic just because there's more people than should be there yeah yeah and that, that could be both a a, a visual thing as, as well as other things but also one of the lovely little um the girls of the families that i was working with her one of her biggest things was heat um so it was always number one if you felt that she was starting to go or was getting a bit irritable was going to head towards a meltdown take off a layer, take off two layers, whatever, whatever was appropriate, take off as many layers as possible so that we could cool her down because that was a biggie. And then you get the summer times where it's just so hot. So it's just like, right, okay, you need to bathe her in a cold bath before she goes to bed. These, these nights are too hot, um, but she's already got a very high level of tactile uh, heat receptors uh, processing going on so we just need to cool her down make sure we've got those towels at bedtime that are already wet um, and that even are in a bucket of ice by her bedtime so that mom and dad can at least get some sleep during those hot nights um, of the summer so yeah heat, heat is a big one I guess one of the things I mean I've learned loads in, in these few interviews we've already had but I think my perception of some people of senses would be but it's not that big a deal. It's just it's just the senses. What what do you need to know about this stuff? But actually, what's coming out more and more is is not just that the senses matter. And there's now eight, well, eight, eighty eighth one of the group, isn't it? <laughs> um, but actually, when we start to understand senses, understand our senses, we can start to understand how certain things can trigger us in order to uh, minimize the effect of that, and we can actually improve. And and sometimes it can be so simple, can't it? It can. It can. And that is why. <laughs> okay. 
obviously I'm going to be biased, but why I love my sensory super system, because we spend like the first weeks, we don't, we don't look at management, we don't look at treatment, we don't do anything. It's about who are you? How is it you function? What is going on in each of your senses? Because they are really, really important. And, and I, I, I love having this opportunity to speak to people because the more people that recognize how important and how powerful and how fundamental those really simple basic senses are, then we have a choice of really helping. We have the chance of really helping people. Um, whereas I, certainly for the first almost 20 years of, of me being a, a therapist, I was very much, if I wasn't in an area where people knew, and understood sensory integration processing, uh, I really was just kind of like, who are you? You're a bit kind of weird. You're a bit kind of mad. So it, it's it's is a, an absolute delight to be able to explain this and for other people to start recognizing that actually sensory processing is huge and it is important and it is worth taking the time to understand and assess ourselves, no matter who you are just have a real deep understanding of who we are. And then obviously for those who we know are impacted, then we really need a deep dive and a, and a deep assessment into their needs. And I think that's what I'm sort of thinking and seeing as we're going through this is, is th- th- we can talk about mental health. We understand mental health is important. Okay. We need some time to ourselves. We need to read a book. We need to you know, drink water. So we, we kind of, we understand our mental health and we understand these things slowly, but actually sensory health is a part of our health, right? But unless, mm it goes wrong or you've got someone who's particularly sensitive it may be something we just disregard like any other part of the health we assume it's all going to work so we have a stomach problem and all of a sudden oh what's wrong and now we're going to see a gp okay you've got a problem and we can deal with that but until it happens you expect it to work and to keep working and then all of a sudden there's a problem and what do we do yeah absolutely absolutely so here we have sensory health coach (laughs) cool uh, just give us your website then so people can get hold of you if they wish Anne Law Jackson and I, obviously when I say that people have no idea perhaps how to spell law unless they're <laughs> French but A-N-N-E L-A-U-R-E and then Jackson that's a, a, a good old British surname isn't it <laughs> cool um, thank you so much for your time uh, for another one of these again we'll get this out on video if you've got any more questions for Anne you can email us here in the studio hello at pure 247 radio hello at pure 247 radio.org we'll pass those questions on to Anne and ask them on air and you can be as anonymous as you wish as you mostly are which is fine that's wonderful thank Thank you Anne for another time it's brilliant see you soon have a great rest of your day bye-bye